in the love of God. I said, well, were you here last night? They said, yes, we were. I said, last night I preached on the love of God and not once did I mention the holiness of God and not one of you men had a problem with that. And I see this even in men who believe right doctrine. When we talk about the love of God, for example, we don't feel like there's a necessity to balance ourselves out in the end of the sermon and say, now I've taught on the love, but I also want you to realize He's holy. But if we teach on the holiness of God, we feel like we have to cater to everyone in the room and go, now I've taught about the holiness of God, but let me go back so I'm not unbalanced. That right there shows us we're unbalanced. You see, we want to make people, we want people to know, and we want to be sure that they know that we're not off balanced. That's wrong. That's wrong. You take, just isolate different teachings of Jesus. And if you just isolated one of his teachings apart from the others, what would you have to say? Unbalanced. Or at least you would say, man, he emphasizes this above everything else. Just preach. Just preach. If you took Romans 9, just by itself, and then Romans 10 and 11, by themselves, what, what would you find? You would think maybe unbalanced. But you bring them together. But it's amazing that we're never worried about being unbalanced about our emphasis on man, or unbalanced on our emphasis of some attributes of God, like love and mercy and compassion. But then when we speak about other doctrines, we're so afraid someone's going to think that we're something. Unbalanced. Now, Something that I want you to see is what I've mentioned, is that there must be a center. Now the question, who's it going to be? There must be somebody first. Who's it going to be? There must be an ultimate motive. What's it going to be? If I just leave it at the ultimate motive is the love of God, for man, not just the love of God, no, the love of God for man. If I leave that as the ultimate motive, no one has a problem with it. But if I put even farther back a greater motive, the glory of God, take the spotlight off of man and put it on God, people start getting a creepy crawly feeling. Something's wrong. This is not right. And it goes back to that sticking your lip out and walking out the door and going, well, what about me? I mean, I've, I've, I've got to be in here somewhere, don't I? You are in there somewhere. But you are in there somewhere because God is love and God does all that He does for His own glory. And if it wasn't the case, if God had to find a motive in you, you would go to hell. Because the only thing a sinful fallen man can motivate a holy righteous God to do is judge him. So if you want God to turn his eyes off of himself and to look for a reason in you, you go right ahead. But it's not recommendable. It's like one time praying in this church and people were coming forward and I kind of came down from the, the podium and I was praying right there on the steps. And this young boy comes up and just gets right beside me and starts praying. Young boy, he was probably 19 or 20. And he's crying out, God, I just want you to give me what I deserve. I have never stopped anyone in the middle of their praying. But I stopped him. I, I poked him. <laughs> and he just didn't pay attention. So I poked him harder. And he looked at me and I said, Don't you ever, ever, Ask God to give you what you deserve. 
Because the only thing you deserve, young man, is to be condemned. Fall upon your face. Plead for mercy. That you not be given what you deserve. But that you be given the very thing you don't deserve. Now, let's look at some, some quotes. People say, yes, he's just going to quotes. Why doesn't he go to Scripture? There's about a thousand Scriptures waiting for us. I just want to nail down a few things. One, in the introduction, that all this talk about God's glory, and again, I, I want to defer here for a moment to Dr. Piper. Really respect the man. But let me say this. These doctrines didn't begin with Dr. Piper. And he would be the first to recognize that. These things have always been believed by godly men. And we have gotten off-center in the evangelical world because we have forgotten about the rock from which we were cut. We have forgotten what historical Christianity is all about. Okay? So, Thomas Boston writes this, Every rational agent proposes to himself an end in working in the most perfect um, and the most perfect highest end. Now God is the most perfect being and His glory the noblest end. Now, notice the word he's using there. Rational in the word agent. Every rational agent proposes a reason or an end for what he's doing. You know. He just does. And if, if he doesn't, we consider him not to be rational. Why are you doing what you're doing? It's like I have you know, all my little children. Why are you doing that? I don't know. That's not rational. There must be a reason. Maturity. Rationality demands. Why are you doing that? Well, I'm doing that because of this. We will even respect a man who at least has a reason for what he's doing, even though it may be irrational, more than a man who has no reason whatsoever. God being a rational being has an end or a reason or a purpose, a sunum bonum, a greater good for what He is doing. And that good, that greatest good, that ultimate reason, of course, is Himself. Now, A. A. Hodge writes, since God Himself is infinitely worthier than the sum of all creatures... It follows that the manifestation of His own excellence is the highest and worthiest end conceivable. Again, there's got to be a reason. Do you really want it to be you? And if God's greatest reason, greatest purpose, greatest motivation is you, have you not then become the center of the universe? The reason for all things. And that, my friend, is perversion. That, if you want an example of perversion, that would be it. For God, the most worthy being, to step down and give the very center of the universe to what would arguably be the least worthy being. Now, Charles Spurgeon writes, God must have the highest motive, and there can be no higher motive conceivable than His own glory. The good of His creatures He considers carefully, but even the good of His creatures is but a means to a main end, the promotion of His glory. All things then are for His pleasure and for His glory. They daily work. Now, as Martin, Martin Zacharias was sharing the other night in our church, and I was translating for him, did you notice something that he said? In the Bible Institute where I studied, they told us about the great men of the faith. Charles Spurgeon, George Mueller, Hudson Taylor, 